Lord says this, delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways unto Him and trust Him and He will do it. I want us to, to do that one more time. And Would you just say that with me? I just want to ingrain this in you. Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to Him and trust Him and He will do it. Lord, that's our prayer today is that we will be delighted in You, in Your presence that is right here with us. Almighty God is in this place. And Lord, I just want to thank You uh, for being here. Lord, it's humbling to know that, uh, that a wretched man like me could be in Your presence. But I thank You, O oh God, for being here. Lord, would our worship today be pleasing in your sight? Would you be honored and would you be praised? Would your name be magnified? And may, uh, may we decrease so that you would increase right here in this place today. For we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. My name is Mirtha Mendoza. For those of you who do not know me, um, if you don't get my name right, it's okay. I've been called so many things. I had this guy one time call me America. I don't understand <laughs> how you get America out of my name. But um, this month is the month where we talk about what we're thankful for and we count our blessings. And I have a lot to be thankful for. God has provided all my need and most of my wants. But I think the one that I'm the most thankful for is being the daughter of the true living God. And my story starts like this. I was raised in a Christian home. I knew all the Christian answers. My daddy was an evangelist, so we traveled around the world preaching the gospel. But, you know, as a kid, you think only because your parents are Christian that makes you Christian. That's not how it works. Uh, my heart was still doing a lot of evil things and a lot of evil thoughts. I think my world kind of started uh, turning around for me, started tumbling around when my spiritual rock and my earthly provider walked out on us on November of 2006 never to be seen again. And I went crazy. Uh, I rebelled against God in so many ways. I gave to my fleshly desires. I became very angry, very bitter, and I ran away from him. I stopped going to church for a year and a half, something that I had never done because I was basically born in a church. And um, I was mad. Uh, I decided to go to church my eighth grade year because there was a boy that I liked and he was there and so I was like well, okay well I'm gonna go and uh, God had different plans for me of course and through the leadership of Stephen James, Hillary James and Caroline Cornelius through their patience, through their love, through their grace um, on the summer of my going towards my freshman year at a youth camp I decided to give my life to Jesus. Now I decided to give my life to Jesus, but I still had a very hard time making him my Lord because I, I couldn't trust him because I said, you know, I, people have failed me. I don't know how to trust him, how to make him my Lord. So my, my life was in the world and in the church, and, and, and I still did things that I'm not proud of, and I still went sometimes to, to my old self, and, and I did it all on my own strength and not on God's. Finally, the summer, going towards my senior year, God gave me um, one option. And he said, you either start living for me or, or you start living for me. Uh, and I said, okay, God, well, I guess I'm just going to start living for you. And so I did. Uh, now, what I really want y'all to grasp is that even though the world tells me tells me and tells us that if people have hurt you, if people have betrayed you, that you should hate them. But God says, no, daughter, I am faithful. I have forgiven you when I gave my son on the cross for you. You are just a sinner, just like the people that have hurt you. And I love you. I love you more than you can ever imagine. Now, if you're a believer here, I want you to have joy in that salvation that he has given you. I want you to know that you're not walking alone, that he is there with you. And if you're not a believer and you're doing things that you're not proud of and that, and that you think you're worthless, I want you to know that God thinks you're worth more than gold and that he wants you so much. 
And, you know, I, I take comfort in this, that even though I'm still going through hardships and it's still very hard for me and God and the devil still whispers in my ear, remember all the things you used to do. I remember that the true living God holds my future and that's what I'm thankful for. Will you please pray with me? Father God, I just thank you for today. I just pray one thing, that your Holy Spirit may just start moving in people's lives right now and that whoever leaves this place doesn't leave the same. But ultimately, God, that you may receive glory and honor for everything that's going to happen in this service, for my life, for everyone else's life, that you may just receive glory and honor. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
by being a part of what God's doing. If you're here to see a show, you're going to be disappointed. I'm not that good looking. That, that, I knew I'd get somebody. Wayne Bolton, let's talk later. Hey, we have another testimony I want you to hear this morning. We're honoring Adoption Month today. November is National Adoption Month. And as I, I prayed through what we would do to honor and commemorate that, it seemed obvious we needed a testimony from, from someone who'd walked that path. So we have one on our staff, actually, that many of you may or may not have actually met. Jeff Miller is our technical director. He hides upstairs in the broadcast booth, usually, so many of you don't ever see him. However, if you've ever gotten a DVD or you've been home and watched us on television, you've seen Jeff's work and been blessed by him. Jeff and his wife, Judy, are adoptive parents. I've asked them to come, and they're going to share their testimony with you. Come on, guys. That was a few years back, back in the early days when dark hair was in fashion. <laughs> well, that's our daughter, Erin, and this was, um, this was actually in October of 1989. Uh, we adopted our daughter, and we actually got her when she was a week old. <clears throat> like every adoption story, uh, each one has its own story and its own set of miracles. We didn't do anything special other than special to us and to our daughter because now we're just family. But our adoption story goes kind of like this. Uh, in February of 1989, we were, oh, that's Wanda and Charlie Nance. They were the foster parents for Aaron for about a week. Um, oh, my. <laughs> February of 19. 89, we began our process of adoption, and uh, we were interviewed and, and went through Living Alternatives in Tyler, Texas. They had just started their adoption agency, Loving Alternative, and um, several people in the church where we were attending had really asked us about, don't y'all want to adopt? Don't y'all want to have a child? And we had tried to have a child and couldn't, and so we began the adoption process, and um, in March, that's outside the courtroom right there, uh, in March of 89, we completed all of our interviews and applications and all that jazz, and um, we were uh, coming home from a Bible study when the uh, adoption agent person, Peggy, came to our front door and said, well, actually, she called at work when I was at work <clears throat> and said, we have a child, we want, you, we want to adopt her into your home. And um, it was just a whirlwind, one-week pregnancy for us, basically. And um, <laughs> we ended up picking up Aaron on Easter Sunday of 19... Sorry. She's a good kid. Um, anyway, we had picked her up on Easter Sunday in Longview, 1989. And um, beyond that, um, let me just tell you a little bit of the background of what happened. I was working at Brookshire Grocery Company and in the advertising department doing radio and TV. And uh, we, were, we had started our adoption uh, interviews and all that, and Aaron had breathing difficulties when she was first born and was going to add about another four thousand dollars of test uh, testing done for her and it almost put us out of the ballpark to be able to afford to adopt this little girl um, a lady came into my office after he overhearing me tell this to some other co-workers and she was big and pregnant and she came in in tears and she wanted she said I have to talk to you she said we were supposed to adopt years ago and the adoption fell through. We were told we can't have any kids and here I am pregnant with my second. She said my father died last November and left us a huge amount of money in his estate. And she said, you have all the money. She said, you have all the money you need. Sorry. And uh, I don't remember how much they gave us, but uh, we eventually uh, were able to pay them back. And 
other friends contributed and we were able to pick up our little girl on Easter Sunday. There she is. Now, let's jump ahead because that was the miracle. That was the thing that God did to bring about a family of, of the three of us. Well, Erin has grown up and um, she was about the best kid we could have ever had. And, uh, you know, she was happy. She was delightful. She was mostly obedient. Um, <laughs> and she's a lot of fun. She went through school. She's grown up to be a young woman. She's 24 years old now. I wish she was here with us. She actually did come in for Thanksgiving week this week, and, and she's spending time with friends right now. Oh, that's the Groucho Marx mustache. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she has graduated from Texas A&M University. Thank you. And uh, when she... Uh, came home from college, we thought, you know, okay, she's going to get a job and a career, an apartment, that sort of thing, and start her life and move on. Yeah, always take your kid to Disney World. Make sure you do that. And uh, instead, she said, came to us and said, I want to go on a mission trip. Well, she had gone on a couple of mission trips in high school with the church youth group, but she said, no, I really want to go on a mission trip. And she talked to a couple of mission organizations. Oh, there we are, Texas A&M. You can see she's getting older, but not a lot bigger. <laughs> um, she eventually went on a thing called the World Race. The World Race is through a, a group in uh, Gainesville, Georgia, called Adventures in Missions. Adventures in Missions sends young people around the world uh, to countries where the need is great on mission trips. She went to 11 countries in 11 months. That's my favorite picture. <laughs> and uh, she started in Kenya and went through three African nations, several Eastern nations, including Cambodia and China. That's the night before she left, right there. All packed up and ready to go. And these pictures now, there's a series of these when she's on the mission field. And she served with uh, churches, orphanages, there's a group in the East called She Ministries, which is self-help and empowerment, which helps young women get out of the cycle of human trafficking. Um, I'll let you enjoy these <laughs> while I gain my composure. Um, and so now she's back, <clears throat> and she uh, now works for the mission organization called Mission Adventures and Missions. She's in their deployment office, and she helps to mobilize and get mission teams together and take applications and help train them to go out into the mission field. So you never know, you know, what's going to happen, and you never know how, how God, you know, moves. And uh, I want to let Judy talk while I uh, wipe off my things. And uh, she can tell you about our family support. At the adoption hearing, they put Jeff on the stand first. <laughs> After the first question, he was crying. I thought, oh boy, we're in for a long time. <laughs> but obviously, he is a dad whose little girl has him wrapped around her fingers, as any daddy should be. The thing I thought I would just comment on in our adoption was the fact that um, our families were so supportive of that. They never feared it. They both welcomed it. My family's in Kansas. They made as many trips to Texas as they could figure out how to do while they were able. And Jeff's family was very loving and, and supportive too. We also, uh, ad ad the adoption agency has a picnic every year because they want these kids, they're adopting out kids to an incredible number of families. And they want these kids to grow up knowing adoption is normal. It is a way of life. It is nothing, there's no stigma attached to it, but it is an opportunity to become a part of a wonderful forever family. And so I teach at Grace Community School. I teach fourth grade. And I had the opportunity to see a lot of children who are adopted. A number of families in our school right now are either fostering or have adopted children outside of their family, even adding on to their own natural children and it is something to see that God has a plan to welcome the orphan into home and so I think it's a it's a fun thing 
to have been an adoptive parent. I kind of forgot about it after the first six months. But it is the kind of thing that reminds us all about what family is and what family is meant to be by the Heavenly Father. Amen. Well, you know, adoption is close to my heart for obvious reasons. Our adoption story you've heard some of, and we'll talk about it in another venue perhaps, but let's talk for a moment about why we chose to do this at all. It's not just because we're trying to highlight adoption. It's not just because we want to bring agencies in, and, and we do. We have agencies on each side of the, of the hallway that can talk to you about how you might get involved with adoptions or how you can support their ministries to help other families do adoption. That's not the whole reason we did this. It's because all of us, ladies and gentlemen, all of us, all of us in Christ have been adopted. We didn't deserve to have Daddy God step in and rescue us. We didn't earn the right for Him to take us on and give us an inheritance of all eternity. We didn't jump up and say, I'm the most beautiful, I'm the most amazing, I'm the most wonderful, you can't get along without me, God. Instead, knowing all that he knew, God looked down through time, space, and eternity and chose you. Lovingly, graciously, beneficently, he wrapped his arms around you and said, I choose you. Grab a hold of that for a second because although some might say, well, this isn't very much of a Thanksgiving type message. Aren't you supposed to do something on gratitude? Ladies and gentlemen, we are. The most important thing that we can be grateful for and eternity forward spent with the Father because he chose us. Go with me back a couple of years to when we got the call that changed our lives on March the 9th, 2011. The summer, the, the season before that, December, Julie and I had been through another failed adoption. We'd been through several. And we had gotten to a place where we said, okay, calf rope, that's enough. If you've ever walked through something like that that hasn't played out like you thought it would, that, that allowed your emotions and your heart to swell thinking this is how God's going to answer his problem and prove his faithfulness and then have it crash down around your ears. You simply can't measure how much that hurts. We got to a place where we said, no more, no more. We're going to walk on a different path. And then on March 9, 2011, seated in my office on a Wednesday night, my wife never comes to my office on Wednesday night. I don't know why she did then. My cell phone rang with the one group we didn't know still had our name and they said we got a baby that's due to be born would you be interested in talking to us we had a 40-day pregnancy so we were ahead of y'all a little bit and when we arrived at the hospital on april 11 2011 we had no idea what adventure lay ahead of us we walk into the hospital, empty-armed and with high hopes, and they point out a small pink bundle laying there, unnamed, just one little sign at the end of its cradle, adoption. Now, let's paint the picture clearly. We're on the outside of the glass, okay? We can't reach and touch him. At that moment, at that moment, we've got a decision to make, don't we? We can walk around and go inside to the nursery and meet our son, or we can walk away. We can walk away and wash our hands and say, thank God we didn't get involved in that mess. And believe me, there have been days. <laughs> Amen? Any parent with me that you had a natural born one and you wondered why you did that to yourself? If that's you, you are, man, I, I feel your pain. We're standing there on the outside of the glass, and you know what? The moment it flashed through my mind, I thought, we could walk away. I kind of like being with my wife. That's why I married her. 
And if we introduce a child into that situation, that child's need level is going to be high. And I'm not going to have time to spend with my wife. And it's going to bring wrinkles on her face from frowning at that child. (laughs) And I'll say things to him when he asks why, the question why, 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 I give him answers like, because there's no bones in ice cream, all right? Later, he'll ask me about that. Why are there no bones in ice cream? And I'll have to come up with a reason for that. You get where I'm going with this. We had a choice to make. Either commit ourselves fully to the welfare of this child for the rest of our lives and the rest of his, or walk away. Those were our only two options. There wasn't anything in the middle. I want to call your attention to that, not calling attention to us, but I want to take you to Romans chapter 8, a passage that is a very crescendo of Christian thought, purpose, and the love and compassion that God has shown for us. Romans chapter 8, take your Bible, and if you would, take out the note sheet that came in your bulletin, because I'd like you to jot down a couple of things. Romans chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 14. If you know anything about the book of Romans, you know that the Apostle Paul has spent the first seven chapters of his book telling the Romans, the church in Rome that has just gotten launched, how it is that they are to think theologically. Chapters 1 through 7 deal with some of the most weighty theological matters in the rest of the New Testament. You won't find a better encapsulation than chapters 1 through 7 of the book of Romans. Chapters 9 through 16, the rest of the book, they take a different sort of tack. They're sort of how to live now that you know all those things. What do you do about all this? So we have the theoretical in chapters 1 through 7 and the practical in chapters 9 through 16. That middle chapter right in the center, the Apostle Paul takes a moment where he talks about who we are. What difference does great theology make for us? And what does that mean? So I want to drag it this morning from the concept of just pure theology of something to know and let you wrap your arms around it the way God wrapped his arms around you. And maybe let you see God as the one who chose you. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 14. Let's stand together as we read from the word of the Lord. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you've not received a spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Pray with me, won't you? On this Sunday before Thanksgiving, Lord Jesus, we take a minute to praise you for choosing us. We recognize our blessings and we count them appropriately so. But we recognize the biggest blessing is being yours. Wearing your name. Being loved by you and sustained by your very hand. I pray that you would speak a word of hope, a word of promise, a word of love into our hearts today. And you would use this moment, Lord, this moment right here to speak that word into hearts that need to hear it. We thank you today, Lord, for the love you have for us and that you've promised us a family and a future. We love you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 
Thank you. You may be seated. I want you to see, first of all, that being adopted means that you are now a part of a family. Now, you know, families are a funny thing, aren't they? You can't choose them. And wouldn't it be nice to unchoose some of your family? Amen? Yeah, I, I knew I'd get somebody to go along with me. Everybody has that crazy relative, right? And if you don't have one, chances are it's you. <laughs> so just take that as a matter of course. But being a part of a family, that's something special, isn't it? Being adopted means you go from being alone to having someone from being isolated to being connected. In John chapter 10, Jesus says this, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Put it another way, he wants to separate. He wants to divide. He wants to isolate. He wants to push us apart. He wants you to believe the lies that he will tell you that no one has ever felt exactly like you do. And so no one can understand it. And so you can't have connection with anybody else because they can't, con they can't actually understand how you feel. And so you should hole up and protect yourself because it's dangerous to allow yourself to be connected. That's true. It is dangerous. But let me just tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. You were formed for fellowship. You were created with an innate need for connectivity. Shared relationships between people. But most importantly, you were formed for fellowship with God. So what happened? What cut us off from that? How is it that we don't have that anymore? Sin. Sin separates us. Sin cuts us off from the relational line that God intended us to have. A holy God cannot bear to be in the presence of sin. And as a result, even one sin, no matter how small, is enough to separate you for all eternity from God. Think of it this way. Have you ever worn a white shirt to an Italian spaghetti dinner? What's going to happen? Invariably, you're going to get something on that white shirt, aren't you? It won't matter who does it, but once it's stained, it's stained. And you can fix it, sure. But grab this with me. For that moment, that stain is obvious, just like it is to God, and sin is evident in our lives. It separates us. It breaks the fellowship that God intended us to have. He longs for you and longs for you to be his. He made you for himself. He wanted you to be in his family. But sin keeps you from that. So the remedy in the Old Testament came in the form of sacrifice. If you read through the book of Leviticus, there's the provision and the prescription for how those sacrifices are to be made. Blood sacrifices. Because sin requires death. Sin kills. Now Satan doesn't advertise that, does he? If he did, no one would buy it. If he did, people would say, no, I, I, I. Sin kills. Thus in the Old Testament, to find forgiveness for your sins, you had to go out into your own flock and pick up an animal, go down on a knee maybe even, and pick that animal up and hold it close to you as you carried along, and take it to the priest and put it in his arms and watch as... This innocent animal paid the price for your sin with blood to forgive your sin. 
Uh, that program lasted for about a thousand years, maybe 1,500, depending on how you want to date the Old Testament. But about 33 AD, things changed. God was so desperate to make you a part of his family that he allowed Jesus to come. And in one stunning, unbelievably huge act of love, Jesus sacrificed his very self for your sin. Paying for your sin with his blood. Now some have come to me well-meaning and well-intentioned saying, Darren, I don't understand how a man who lived 2,000 years ago and bled then paid for the sin penalty of my sin when I'm 40 years old. There are some theological precepts that I can't explain. But I can tell you this. The Word of God says it's true. And it is our compass. It is our guide. And if it says it's true, then I'm resting comfortably in it. So the penalty paid by one man cleansed all of us. But it didn't stop there, ladies and gentlemen. Let's not stop there. Because now when we're in the book of Romans, this is when it starts getting exciting. It didn't stop there. Because not only did that penalty did that Jesus paid for us, not only did it, did, it, did it cleanse us, but it did something else. It took us from being isolated, cut off, separated, individualized. It took us and brought us together. And that all of those who are in Christ, now we have a new identity. We're no longer that orphan, broken, sinful, alone we are now, wait for it, a part of a family. A part of a family. Oh, my goodness. A part of a family? That means we have been embraced. That our identity has been changed. See it again in the verses that we started with. Verse 14. He says, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Verse 15, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but instead you've received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father, Abba, it might sound a little weird to you. If you've got the message or one of the more modern translations, you see it as we normally say it in our culture. Papa, Daddy. I got to tell you, those kind of connections are rare, aren't they? We've been granted that. So what does it look like? Well, for that, I'll go back to my own family for a moment. We pick that child up and take him on as our own. We go to the judge. He gives us a decree. And by the way, our experience was very different than the one you saw with Jeff and Judy. When we sat down in the courthouse, it was Good Friday. And we sat down in the courthouse. The judge had come in for our case and our case only. He sat down with us and spent about 10 minutes talking to us. Most of that time he spent trying to convince us Joshua was born in Arkansas that our son should grow up as an Arkansas Razorback fan. <laughs> Gospel truth right there. I didn't have the heart to tell him how orange my blood really was <laughs> or that I had a Longhorn outfit waiting for our child in the car. But nevertheless, it was so stunning in its simplicity we signed our names like three, maybe five times. If you've ever bought a car, if you've ever bought a house, you know how long you sit there at the closing table where they sign this release. We can't be held liable for this. We won't be held liable for that. You're going to be held accountable for this. We are going to hold your feet to the fire for that. And you sign your name over and over and over again, don't you? And here I'm sitting at this table with this thin, flimsy little document that entitles me and binds my life for all perpetuity to this child. And I'm going, wait a minute, that's too easy. Because in that moment, we walked in as husband, wife, 
and a child we're not connected to. We walked out as a family of three, sharing a name, sharing an identity, and sharing a story. Is your story any less valid? Absolutely not. Because here's what happened to you. At some point in your past, perhaps you invited Christ into your life. And if you haven't, I've got good news. In just a minute, I'm going to give you a chance to. You can come down here and meet with me and we'll introduce you to Christ. And you can go from being that isolated orphan to having a family. Ladies and gentlemen, at some point in the past, you walked into the throne room of God. You called out to him and said, God, I'm broken. I have no, nothing to offer you. I have no hope. I have no future. I have no family. But I'm calling on you because of the shed blood of your son, Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, you went in that moment from being that isolated orphan to being a part of a family. A family who loves the Lord and each other. Being adopted means you're a part of a family. Your life is connected to others. So here's what it means in practical senses. It means that that family, that family all has a common father. See his name there at the end of verse 15. Abba, Father. Daddy. A shared connection. You know, when we were in El Salvador earlier this month, it was pretty crazy to me to see the vast diversity of people. And yet, when we sat down to worship together, that diversity seemed to disappear because we were all calling on the same God. You're a part of a family, church. And that family loves one another. And that family has a common father. Not only do we have a common father, not only a part of a family, but it means we've been chosen. Deliberately, willfully, volitionally, God chose us. I want to turn your attention to another one of Paul's letters, Ephesians chapter 1, just a couple of books later, verses 4 and 5. Doug's going to put the verses up I've chosen up on the screen. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him, in love, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. What I really want you to see is in verse 4. He chose us. I want to show you some pictures of some individuals. Maybe you know their story, maybe you don't. This is the first one. His name's Dave Thomas. Dave is adopted. Dave is also the founder of Wendy's, the famous burger joint named for his daughter. What you may not know is that nobody wanted Dave when he was a baby. You think if they could have looked down into the future and seen how fabulously rich he was going to be, there would have been somebody to take him? I bet so. Here's another one. Faith Hill. Adopted. Do you think if they could have looked down into the future that there would have been people who wanted Faith? Here's another one. George Herman Ruth, better known as Babe. He spent the first several years of his life in orphanages. And he even spent some time in an industrial school for boys because nobody wanted him. There was a father there, Brother Matthias. 
who saw something in Babe and taught him a simple boy's game, baseball. Do you think if they had known how fabulously famous Babe would have been, that he would have spent even one day in an orphanage? This is what I'm calling your attention to. Being chosen means that you've got some security, some stability. Being chosen, according to Ephesians 1, Doug, pull that back up just one more time. I want, to, I want you to see this. According to Ephesians 1, verse 4, Ephesians says this, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. What did you do to earn that choosing? Not one blessed thing. He chose you in spite of yourself. He chose you with love. He chose you because He chose you. You didn't do anything to earn it. You don't deserve it. And yet, He chose you. In my own context again, what had Joshua done when we came to get him on April 11, 2011? Besides be born, what had he done to earn the investment that we have now made in him? I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about sleep. You know what I'm saying to you? <laughs> I learned a valuable lesson not long ago. Put a cover on the light switches because he's tall enough to reach them. One night not long ago, it was about 6 o'clock in the morning. Normally I'm up for a workout at that time, this particular day. I was giving myself the day off and sleeping in. Heard a few steps and didn't think anything further about it, and the light came on in our bedroom. Not a lamp, the overhead, the big, bright, shining sun. You know what I'm saying to you? And I was going, why in the world is my wife turning on the light in the middle of the night? And I look over to find her looking at me the same way. <laughs> and I said to her with all great love, your son needs you to deal with him. <laughs> at that moment, I didn't choose him. Because he was standing there showing me how tall he was that he could reach the switch. Yeah, son. The only problem really became he was tall enough to turn it on, not off. I want you to think with me about that for a moment because it's a stupid story, but it's an accurate one. Depicting how sometimes God chooses us in spite of ourselves. Rather than being cross with him, I got up and gathered him in my arms, turning the light off as I went, and brought him back to our bed and laid down with him. Rather than spank him for turning the light on, I loved him and told a goofy story on Sunday morning about it. Why? Because I chose him, just like God chose you. I chose him, just like God delights in choosing you. And I want you to see something that kind of hides in the Greek. This chosen word that you see in Ephesians 1 it's not a one-time, fits-all category. It's a continued action. He chose you, but the ramifications of that are not yet done. He's still choosing you. See, some people get in their minds that if they do enough bad things, God will abandon them. No. He chose you long for you to come home. I saved the best news for last. Being adopted not only means that you have a home or that you've been chosen, it means you have a future. Being adopted means you have a future. See, we all have a future. It's just a matter of how we'll spend it. We're not guaranteed that, but ladies and gentlemen, all of us were made as eternal beings. Beings with eternity wrapped up in our hearts, so says the book of Jeremiah. And because of that eternity in our hearts, we will all spend eternity somewhere, be it in heaven or in hell. And that eternity forward 
is that stark in its choice? We only have two options, and that's all of them, heaven or hell. Because God chose us, because he adopted us, because we responded to that choice and that invitation, we have an eternity forward secure in the future with him. Galatians chapter 4 says it the best of all of Paul's letters. I want you to see it. We're going to start in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. But when, notice I've highlighted it on the screens, the fullness of time came. Fullness of time. Have you ever not known what time it was? It happened to me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I had told, we were supposed to catch our flight to El Salvador at 5.30 in Tyler. Fly to Houston and then go from there on to El Salvador with the rest of the group. And I had told Tom several times, Tom, I'll be at your house at 4.15. Yeah, that's pretty ugly, isn't it? I'll be there at 4.15. I'm not going to honk. I'm not going to call you so we won't wake up our families. I'm going to be in your house, at your house at 4.15. Just come out and I'll pick you up. Okay. I'll be there, Darren. I'll be ready and waiting. So I set my alarm and I went on about my business and then I woke up at 4.27. I jumped straight out of bed and stood up and said, it's 427. <laughs> My poor wife, startled yet again from a deep sleep, this time by me, not our son, jumps up and helps me get out the door at 5, 432. I picked up time. That tells you how fast I went out the door. If I'd known what time it was, I would have made better preparation, wouldn't I? God knew what time it was. Pull it up again, Doug. When the fullness of time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, under the law, just like us. Verse 5. So that he might redeem those, buy back those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Receive. It's a gift. What makes something a gift is not the giving. What makes something a gift is the receiving. That we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And this verse is the one that seals the deal for us with the future. Therefore, you are no longer a slave. You are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Ladies and gentlemen, those of us in Christ, we may face some travails in this life, but we have a future. A future not inflicted by sin that stains us while we're here. A future not limited by the calendar or the watch that we wear on our arm. A future not restricted by the limitations of our bodies or the sicknesses that might inflict upon us. A future not concerned with the dangers that others will present upon us. A future that is broad and limitless because it is in the very presence of God. And ladies and gentlemen, if you can't be thankful for that, I got nothing for you. Because that's the difference between being an orphan who needs a home and being a beloved son. Perhaps you're here today and you are sort of like that prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. You knew what it meant to have a home and you've wandered away. Just like the father in Luke 15 Jesus offers you the opportunity to come home, to find in him the hope and the home that you're looking for. Maybe you're here today and you've realized you are that orphan, cut off and isolated by your own sin. Come down here today and get right with him. Maybe you're here today and you just need to come to this altar and say, I 
as your child have made some mistakes, Lord, and I need to get them straight with you. And before we do anything this Thanksgiving week, I want to start that way. Here's your chance to do that. Right here and right now. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you today that you have made us to be yours. You adopted us and made us a part of your family, not because we earned it, not because we deserve it, but because you chose us before the foundations of the world. In love, you predestined us and made us yours. May we live our lives as an expression of gratitude for that very moment, Lord. There's a lot of things that crowd in on us, that call for our attention, that seem important. But Lord Jesus, help us to be mindful of the fact that we are yours. And with that comes a great deal of hope, comfort, a security, and a future. I have no doubt, Lord, there are people here today who need to know that kind of hope, that kind of security, that kind of comfort, and that kind of a future. Don't let us call and say another time, another place, another day. Now, Lord, move in people's hearts and move them to be down here. I thank you today, Father. Your word is trustworthy. And when it says when, that you adopt us as your own, that's exactly what you do. Move in this place, Lord, in this moment, right here and right now, and give people courage. If you've prompted them to make a decision, to come down here and make that decision public. We love you, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. So here's your chance to respond. We're not going to tarry long. Here's your chance to respond. If God is moving in your heart to make a decision and make it public, right here and right now is your chance. Stand with me, won't you?